Okay, I, I hope everyone uh, had a, a great lunch. And uh, once again, thank you to Georgetown University, which uh, provided uh, that lunch to all of us so that we could stay together as a group and could, you could work on your homework. And uh, it's, a big, it's a big advantage. And uh, you know, these breaks in lunchtime, uh, we see as part of an extension of what we're trying to achieve in Mad Scientist. So uh, we, we really appreciate Georgetown's generosity and giving us that opportunity. Um, I had lunch with a great Georgetown student today, Drew Bailey, somewhere we're linked in together now. And, uh, and I know what he wants to do when he goes out and works. And uh, th you know, that's what this is all about. So there, there you go. So I just want to remind everyone, uh, we, we've had a, gr a great virtual audience so far, uh, well over 200 in the chat room. And I read some of their comments. And their comments were not as great as yours, but equally as good. OK. so. Uh, so th some great uh, interaction going on in the chat room, uh, but that's more people that are in this room. So the big idea is that virtually uh, that we're trying to expand uh, what's going on. If you are in the virtual environment or if you're in this room, uh, you can look at that chat room and what's going on at www.tradoctorarmy.mil backslash watch. Uh, at that location as well uh, is the sci-fi compendium, which are the best 25 stories. Um, a short piece that Allison and uh, Luke Shabro, who's back in the back, wrote about that. Uh, you can pull that down on PDF. You can also pull down the Deep Futures paper. It's a reminder that you were provided when you came here. And in that paper, on the second page, there's a short link that you can click on, not if you're behind the nipper wall. So if you're in the Pentagon watch now watching this, do not put in the chat room. You cannot get to that link. Go to your smartphone, put the link in, it'll drive you to a spot where you can provide feedback, um, and we, we ask for your feedback. And we don't need to be told we're great people. We want you to challenge us on how we're thinking about the future. So take this opportunity to give us the feedback that will make all of us better and make our organizations more future ready, because that's what this is about. So we're kicking off a great afternoon focused on one of the uh, exploding technology developments uh, affecting humans today. And that is the oper operationalization of the Internet of Things and what it looks like where we live and, uh, and how we interact within smart cities. And we have several great presenters uh, that are going to talk to talk to us about this. And you're like, well, what does smart cities have to do with the Army? Our first presenter today is going to ask you that question. Mr. Richard Kidd is the Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Army for Strategic Integration. Mr. Kidd, um, in this role, he leads the strategy development, resource requirements, and overall business transformation processes for the Office of Assistant Secretary of the Army for Installations, Energy, and Environment. He's also responsible for developing and monitoring performance metrics for the Army's installation management community, as well as leading a strategic effort to examine options for future Army installations. So Mr. Kidd's going to kick this off for a great afternoon. Uh, let's get started. Great. Thank you. So uh, thanks, Tom Greco and the TRADOC team for having me. Thanks to General Perkins for introductory remarks and for Georgetown for hosting it. You know, I really don't like to talk to groups of Army scientists. Uh, it, it goes back to my first experience, which was pretty traumatic. In uh, 2001, I was asked to speak to the Defense Science Board. I'd spent the 90s as a relief worker, and I'd worked alongside the Taliban in Afghanistan. And actually, in the late 90s, they were a lot better than the warlords, so the Talibs were my buddies. After 9-11, everyone wanted to learn about the Talibs, so I got called in, I had a little road show, and I spoke at the Defense Science Board. And they had a fiction writer there, Tom Clancy, some of you have heard of him. He was on the Defense Science Board. So I'm nervous because I'm out of my league, it's all three and four stars and PhDs and representatives from Sandia and other national labs, and I get up there and Clancy falls asleep. All right. <laughs> And it's not, it's not like someone in class or at one of the Pentagon meetings who's trying to stay awake. Clancy fell asleep, all right, and he was snoring, and I was traumatized, okay, because obviously I can't hold anybody's attention long enough to stay awake. So I hurry through my presentation. I ask for questions. Clancy wakes up and raises his hand. And I'm like, there's no way this guy's got a question. So I call, on him, I call on him, and he asks a very cogent, informed, and precise question on something that he slept right through. 
So uh, afterwards, the four-star admiral who ran the board put his arm around me and said, don't feel bad. He does that to everybody. <laughs> so, uh, but if any of you sleep, I'm going to expect you're doing the Clancy imitation, and I will call on you for the question. All right, so I'm here to ask your help. All right, as a community, I want your help in thinking about the future of Army installations. We thought about warriors and weapons and tactics. But what about the 156 installations where readiness begins? All right, so a couple of months ago, before I'd heard General Perkins, our team said installations are the initial maneuver platform of the Army. So let's go back to what General Perkins said this morning. And he talked about maneuver, and he gave this great example of uploaded tanks in the Fulda Gap ready to maneuver out of their motor pool and fight the enemy. It's no different today, all right? Maneuver begins on our installations, and if the enemy can, they will fix our army on our installations, and if we are stuck there and unable to deploy, he's won. He or she has won. The enemy has won before we even left the United States. So I'd like to ask your attention to help us wrestle with that problem. Here's a little bit of what we've come up with so far, all right? There's three major trends that are affecting our installations. One is that threats are different, all right? We already know the Russians are going to intervene and involve themselves in domestic policy issues and that they're going to shut down energy grids and they're going to go on social warfare attacks in Ukraine. Never happened here, right? All right. We've talked about empowered individuals. We've talked about social media warfare. Soldiers in the room, how many of you have deployed? All right. How many of you have children? How many of your children have a social media presence? Your child's social media presence is part of the order of battle for the bad guys. So when you deploy, your teenage daughter is going to get the modified pictures of your body coming home on the day you deploy. How does that complicate you getting out of the installation? Are you now fixed and able to maneuver? From the new battlefield framework, the second major trend, all right, the diagram multi-domain battle, it's in the, the books and the work that TRADOC has done. So in the past, air land battle, you've got rear close, and what is that? Deep close and rear, thank you, I can't read it from here. But anyway, now you've got the strategic support area, all right? This is part of the battlefield, and that's where our installations are here in the continental United States. So they are now just as much a part of the battlefield as a forward operating base or a patrol base. So in the midst of all that, though, there's also tremendous opportunity. You know, the Army is a pretty closed organization. But if you look at what our cities are doing and towns and communities across America in terms of taking advantage of the Internet of Things, which we're going to hear about afterwards, in accelerating the delivery of public goods and services to their citizens, all right? The communities, the small towns in America are able to do so much more with their taxpayer dollars to make the lives of their citizens better than we were just a few years ago. So that's what our soldiers or future soldiers are going to come from. They're going to expect that on their Army installation. So how do we meet new challenges, respond to growing threats, and uh, while taking advantage of, of the emerging opportunities? Well, on the installation community, we want to do the exact same thing as what we're doing in the operational community. There's a dedicated process to look at the future of the Army operating force. We need a similar dedicated process to look at the future of the Army generating force in the installations where that power is generated from. We're going to look at the 12 trends. You can talk about all of these individually. Uh, you know, I spent a lot of time as the Army's Chief Sustainability Officer. General Perkins talked about climate change, or talked about Fort Jackson, okay? Climate change, one, it's real, we're causing it, and we're sure about it, okay? It's not going to go away. Fort Jackson, South Carolina, medium prediction of the national climate change impacts is that by 2050, 120 days a year are going to be cap four or hotter training days. How are we going to put 65,000 soldiers through an installation where one third of the days they can't do strenuous physical activity outside? All right. <clears throat> Where's a power generation and storage? Another one of my, um, one another, another one of the topics I've spent a lot of time on. The Army is building 
energy resilient microgrids where we're able to produce power on our own installations, but is driven by opportunities in the marketplace. All right, Hawaii, power is expensive, microgrid is relatively cheap. We need to do that in a deliberative manner focused on our war fighting needs, prioritized around those deployment platforms, and also focused on resiliency. Um, we had comments on resiliency earlier this morning. The Army strategy right now does make resiliency the organizing principle of our energy and water systems. It needs to be the organizing principle for our installations. But <clears throat> what's more interesting for our installations is if you start to look at a convergence uh -oh, amongst these trends, if you take the same sort of set of technologies, you've got <clears throat> you know, uh, sensors everywhere, predictive analytics, deep learning, and we know that one of our advanced buildings is starting to, f to, to go out of, uh, uh, starting to fail, the building's gonna fail, so we send a technician out there, uh, he or she doesn't know the training, doesn't know necessarily how to fix the specific piece of equipment, but they've got artificial intelligence that walks them through that, and the part that they need is manufactured at our Department of Public Works, put on a drone, flown out, and installed all in the course of one day before the building has failed. Same technology, predictive analytics, social media, knows when the organization is going to deploy. Same 3D printer, manufactures a bomb. Same 3D drone, delivers it on the, the installation commander when he or she assembles to speak to the families about their deployment. So you have the same technologies, one that can dramatically reduce the expenses and costs on the installation, the others which create a vulnerability. We're trying to do a, a couple of projects right now. We've got a smart and resilient installations initiative with the Army Corps of Engineers. It uh, <clears throat> talks about creating a, con a control center it uses all the different data streams to support our installation commanders. Frankly, I think that's the wrong term. It should be a command center. We should think of our garrisons and our garrison commanders just as much as in the fight as if they were a brigade commander or a division commander. That garrison commander needs to know when they're under social media attack, when they're under cyber attack, whether or not they may have to have their own shore ad assets on the installation to take out those drones that we were talking about. So uh, we're starting to look to the future, but this is where we need, as I said, some more of your help. We're going to be looking at future installations in these four ways. We're trying to adapt to the changing readiness requirements, explore private sector advances. So we're very interested in what's going on out there in terms of Internet of Things and delivery of public services. We want to look beyond the five-year POM cycle. Again, that was mentioned this morning for the installation community. <clears throat> you know, we are where the Army has chosen to accept financial risk and hardship to keep readiness up, which was, I think, the right decision, of course. But, uh, but we are very much, if anything, we're at a year of execution, a one-year time horizon. How do we pay the bills this year? And we've got to get out of that and start to look a little bit longer term. And we, now need, and we also need to start to build our installations and get them both resilient and flexible and adaptable to accommodate some of the futures that folks have been talking about today. So in summary, for those of you from TRADOC, we not only want to put the F back in .mil PF, we want to make it actually part of the war fight. So for too long, the, the facilities component of .mil PF is, all right, you buy a new tank, and it's six inches wider than the old tank, so the doors on your motor pool have to be a foot wider, all right? That's not what we mean. We need to start to look at our installations and the facilities on them as part and parcel to that war fight and that readiness. So I think I did that in about 10 minutes. Am I taking questions or are we waiting until after the next one? Sir, we had, we had time for two questions. Great. All right, who was sleeping? <laughs> All right. You've already asked a question. We'll come back to you, Mr. Cassa. We'll see if someone else who hasn't asked a question. Um, so Tyler Sweat, Chopper Associates. Um, Thank you. Um, so we've talked throughout the day on changing identities, how people are identifying in groups and virtual worlds, um, you know, the shifting sort of borderless nature of war. And then we kind of come full circle and talks about a fixed geography of an installation. That's right. So in a world that's increasingly blurry, that's increasingly not tied to geography, why, why do installations matter? Oh, come back. I was writing notes during the other speakers. And if you talk about the bottom line, so I agree with you. 
all right, this is, a, this is a comment, our installations are sanctuaries, all right? We've thought of our installations in the terms of geography. They been, our army has been protected by these two massive oceans, all right? And, World War, and we've been safe, all right? We can no longer think of our installations as sanctuaries. We absolutely need to go to virtual, online, collaborative training and learning. We need to partner with private, uh, like in energy and water, all right? We're not, we might need to be able to island sometimes, but we're actually more resilient when we're connected to that broader grid and, in, in, and can operate in collaboration with them. Uh, this notion of our boundaries. So first of all, any special forces guy, I'll tell you a fence really, it doesn't do much. So why don't we think differently about perimeter control in terms of remote detection, pattern awareness, other things, so we can have portions of our installations much more open to the community when and where they need to be, while other portions of the installation are much safer and more restricted, that we look beyond the fence lines and we can see things before they necessarily happen. Uh, I think we can harness technology in a lot of ways. Uh, I think geography was still important, but it's not as important as it once was. Did you have a question, sir? I was thinking if I could give a 30-minute capsulated presentation to the Harrisonburg Rotary Club of what I've heard here today, what questions would I get? And I think one of the questions I would get is, is there some relationship between what we're talking about today and a, a renewed or different definition of civil defense? And you're really talking on your installations to some degree about civil defense type activities, I think, for the installations. I just wanted to raise that as a point because I think I would get that question. And I think the civilian communities in America, if they could hear what I've heard today, would have that on their mind. Yeah, I think we, it's civil defense, but I, I think the term and concept we want to talk about is resiliency because many of the things that we have that so resiliency is it's not one specific threat. It's a set of characteristics so at the individual level, the organizational level, the infrastructure level that allow that entity to take a hit and get back up and be stronger. Okay? And that's important whether you're talking about a physical attack like 9-11, a cyber attack, or a natural disaster. So if we go back to climate change and the increased incidence of extreme weather events, you know, the, res the things that make a community resilient are going to be valuable in all of these different circumstances. For a long time, we've had this trade-off between efficiency. You know, we want just-in-time delivery of everything, a highly efficient system, a low-cost system, but one that is fragile. So we might need to be thinking of our systems dynamics in a slightly different way both at our community level and our installation level. All right, thanks so much. Sir, thank you for...